wonderful talk and every time we listen to you we learn so much as you really make shapisma so simplified so i think without wasting much time we'll go to the next speaker and here mm -hmm. i introduce my very good friend dr melin naik who is an expert in cosmetic and reconstructive surgery of the eyelids and face he completed his training in eye plastic surgery at steen eye institute ucla and is now a full time consultant at a prestigious lv prasad eye institute hyderabad He is an adjunct professor of Technology University of Rochester. Dr. Naik is known for his minimally invasive eye plastic surgery, the cosmetic eyelid and the facial procedures, and also the thyroid eye disease. Over to you, Milin. Well, thank you so much, Kasturi, for the kind introduction. Are my slides visible? Yes. Well, at the outset, I would really like to thank. Uh, AIOS, uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma, and particularly Dr. Santosh Vanavar, for including me in this wonderful webinar. It's really an honor and privilege to be present among several of my teachers and uh, guides and mentors. So my topic today is to uh, talk about lids, uh, last but how, and as the title suggests. Uh, it's about the eyelid concerns in thyroid eye disease so most of what i'm going to speak about is has been mentioned and derived from the textbook that we recently published with springer so as we all know the thyroid paradigm is to initially tackle proptosis and then you take care of motility and third comes the eyelid and finally the last paradigm is to deal with aesthetics so most of my talk is going to hover on these last two areas so in today's theme i'm going to talk mainly about eyelid retraction then a little bit about ptosis in thyroid eye disease and also the aesthetic aspects pertaining to the eyelid So talking about retraction if we were to look at the upper eyelid retraction it can be simply uh graded as mild where the lid is at the upper limbus moderate where is it it's up to 2 mm of scleral show and severe when it's more than 2 similarly the lower eyelid retraction can be graded as 1 mm 2 to 3 mm and more than 3 mm So retraction in thyroid eye disease uh, has to be dealt slightly differently if you are looking at active versus inactive disease. So in active, uh, the options that we have are either botulinum toxin or a filler gel, or even triamcinolone. And if we look at this uh, table, which summarizes each of these components. botulinum toxin is primarily effective in the inactive phases or towards the end of the active phase of the disease and uh, an average dose that has been reported in multiple publications is 5 units and uh, this does give us a fair amount of relaxation for a couple of weeks but ptosis and diplopia can be a concern hyaluronic acid gel can be used for upper as well as lower eyelid it has a longer lasting effect and it is reported to be more effective in active disease where the fibrosis hasn't set in and you probably might be able to stretch the muscle to lengthen the eyelid triamcinolone again uh, as you would guess it's more effective in the active disease 10 to 40 mg is your dose and the effectivity would be for 2 to 4 weeks and this was tested upon earlier as intravital injections in active phase So here is an example of a young male, uh, three to four months down the line in the thyroid eye disease. You can see that the left SRLPS complex is slightly thicker, and since he had a marriage coming up, uh, we just reduced the eyelid position with a botulinum toxin transconjunctival injection. Another example in a bilateral case. Obviously, these are going to last only for a couple of weeks. Here is a lady with the right upper eyelid. retraction mild to moderate with a down gaze lag and she was treated with a single triamcinolone injection into the superior orbit 
HHL I've used very rarely, but this was one particular case I uh, remember where we had a transconjunctival injection. The result is uh, not perfect, but it has dropped the upper eyelid down. However, in these patients, I do see in down gaze a slight hump, which is created because of the filler injection. Now, tarsorophy can be a very good tool, uh, especially in active phase of the disease. And uh, we do occasionally see patients with infectious keratitis. And those are the cases where tarsorophy would be useful. Retraction in inactive phase, the options we have are millerectomy, then leave it a recession surgery and a full thickness blepharotomy. Although before we talk about them, I uh, feel that an extreme lateral tarsorophy is a very good option in cases which have a mild temporal flare and also a lower eyelid temporal flare. These patients, it's very predictable and easy to quickly do an extreme lateral tarsorophy. Mueller muscle options include either just recession or there is a described recession with suture to fix it to the levator. And the third is Mullerectomy. And here I'll quickly go through Mullerectomy steps where you evert the upper eyelid. You get into two planes. One is between the levator and the Mueller's and the other is between the Mueller's and the conjunctiva and simply excise the muscle. So everted eyelid, transconjunctival infiltration, then incision at the upper edge of the tarsus. You're separating the Mueller's muscle here. So it's being separated from this white looking levator muscle. So that's the Mueller's and the conjunctiva. That's the second plane you're dissecting. And finally, the Mueller's is separated from the levator and conjunctiva and excised along its entire width of the uh, lid and you can see that the instrument is clearly visible here indicating it's only conjunctiva. I use fibrin glue to fix this and this is a patient who was not concerned really about the inferior scleral show or the mild proptosis but she just wanted the upper eyelid corrected and in her case we chose this millerectomy. With levator we have options of either recession alone or recession with a spacer. Spacer is not particularly my uh, personal choice. So here is a lid crease incision, infiltration. Uh, we reach up to the levator, that's the tarsus and the edge of the levator. And we are separating the edge of the levator from the tarsus in a graded manner as we assess the patient's lid position on table. Very useful to do this under local anesthesia. Here is a case with right upper eyelid moderate lid retraction with down gaze lag and a slight temporal flare, which was treated with anterior approach levator recession. I prefer an anterior approach over the posterior to minimize the tarsal plate show asymmetry. Full thickness blepharoplasty is obviously the, the uh, final option in this graded response that we have, where you expose the levator and you ultimately create a full thickness cut from the skin to the conjunctiva, leaving a small bridge of conjunctiva in the center to maintain the contour. And here you can see the lid position has dropped to the level that on table you felt is comfortable. This is a patient who was treated with a full thickness blepharotomy for the eyelid. Lower eyelid retraction can either be bilateral symmetrical or unilateral asymmetrical, or it could be secondary to a strabismus surgery. And in these cases, you can do a retractor release plus or minus spacer. And in some cases, I also choose a preferential anterior floor decompression, especially if it's bilateral. A forced upward traction test, which uh, Bob taught us, is very useful to assess a tight IR, uh, tight uh, retractor, and retractor release would be a choice here. This is a patient who had bilateral lower eyelid slightly asymmetric uh, scleral show. And this she was treated with lower eyelid retractor release. This case, not really thyroid, it's a unilateral high myopia. Here also we did a retractor release with traction sutures combined with an extreme lateral tarsorophy to give her symmetry. So these are just steps of lower eyelid retractor release where initially you see that the instrument is not visible, the scissor below 
because there is a retractor and conjunctiva. And then I'm getting into the plane between retractors and the conge to ultimately leave only conge here and the retractors are recessed. Choosing floor as a decompression option uh, is a given when you have a three wall decompression, but in some cases where it's a two wall or a choice, I would preferentially choose floor so as to reduce the extreme amount of scleral show. So here you can see the canthus is hitting the limbus, whereas when you move the eyeball down, it's practically hitting the lower end of the pupil. So the eyeball is moved down because I obviously cannot move the eyelid up through a degree of three to four millimeters. Talking about ptosis, uh, it's always been the upper eyelid retraction, which uh, has stolen the thunder about diagnosing thyroid eye disease. But we do see a lot of patients who come with ptosis. And although our first reflex would be that myasthenia should be the diagnosis there, we find that two thirds of these patients are aponeurotic and it's more common in fat disease than in muscle disease. So maybe the fact acts like a, like a increased orbital pressure, which kind of tends to uh, detach the levator from the tarsus. So here is a case which had mild proptosis along with levator disinsertion, and there was a combined surgery performed. Finally, coming to the aesthetics, uh, if you look at aging versus thyroid eye disease, because of the corrugator overaction, you would have glabular furrows. The brow fat pad is increased in these patients. Here you can see the medial fat pad too. So for the glabular lines, you can either use botulinum toxin or if they are static, you can use fillers. Here is a case where the lower eyelid tear troughs were treated with a filler injection in a patient with borderline thyroid eye disease. Here, this slide is particularly to show you that when we focus only on proptosis reduction, we actually aren't really changing the aesthetics of the eyelid. So here I've gotten a reduction on either side, but the patient isn't particularly happy. Even though the lit recession surgeries are pending, she's still concerned about this uh, fat in the upper eyelid. So combining these things probably is the best way to go. Negative vector is something which we have to keep in mind whenever we are planning lower eyelid surgeries in thyroid patients. These are cases where a mild tear trough after the rehabilitation can be treated with filler injections. And if the proptosis is very mild, you could just get away with a blepharoplasty. Lacrimal grand prolapse is rare, but is possible. And this has to be kept in mind, especially in cases who have mild proptosis, who don't really want the decompression. And these rare occasions, you might have to do lacrimal gland fixation. Subconjunctival fat prolapse, although not really an eyelid issue, can be a cosmetic concern, and this just needs transconjunctival excision. Finally, the last slide, which talks about multiple ways in which premalar and cheek swelling and fluid accumulation can be very frustrating, and I haven't yet found any useful method of treating these. So just to summarize, we talked about lid retraction, uh, ptosis, our experience, and few aesthetic issues pertaining to the eyelid. And all these, again, are covered in three chapters in our textbook. Thank you very much.